and irritating a pearl inside it, I decided that's as far back as, as I wanted to go, and I just departed from Scientology altogether. <laughs> In late 1952, Hubbard came to London. He was still in financial trouble back home. A business partner had just issued a warrant for the return of $9,000 Hubbard had borrowed. To make money, he needed to go international. And here, instead of creditors, he found a new group of adoring fans. He was really flamboyant. I mean, he was... Um he was full of life. I mean, he rode about on his, his Harley motorcycle and uh, we threw parties and he would play his guitar and, um, you know, just sing and put on his cowboy hat and, I mean, he was, he was just lots and lots of fun. We'd all get together and then we would do um, various exercises and we'd go out and um, see if just with thoughts we could knock, out, knock off policemen's hats or... You know, what kind of power did we have in terms of thinking and thought and energy and that sort of thing. I mean, it, it was great fun. I thought it would give me total control over my own life. I mean, it sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? But I mean, put in, in those terms, that's basically what Hubbard was saying. He was saying that you and everyone else, with the use of Scientology or Dianetics at that time, could become a god. And we were all, if you like, fallen gods. The next step was to create a church for his new gods. A writer friend called Lloyd Eschbach later recalled how, after a dinner in the late 1940s, Hubbard had said, I'd like to start a religion. That's where the money is. Now, a few years later, the Church of Scientology was born. In America in particular, there were sound practical reasons. There are tax advantages, and there are advantages in the Constitution, which says that the government may not uh, abridge the operations of a church. And I think that that, more than anything else, made him agree to uh, using that vehicle, because it's, it is, and has indeed proved, uh, to be very difficult for any government to abridge the activities of a church. Hubbard found the perfect cathedral for his church, St. Hill Manor, in East Grinstead in Sussex. He played his new role, the country squire. He told the locals that he was a scientist, researching plants, and their reaction to pain. He and his young family settled into Sussex society, bringing American razzmatazz to East Grinstead's road safety campaign. But the locals hadn't realized that St. Hill was to become the mecca of Scientology. Devotees arrived from all over the world to study at their master's Hi. feet. I'm Jim Mondeer from LA. They paid thousands of pounds for Hubbard's courses. Now, the mind, when it has an old experience, will add that data into its current experience, and it keeps coming up with wrong answers. Virginia Downsborough was on the first St. Hill clearing course. Ron had such an amazing ability for making you feel that you were just so important to him and so... Uh, so valued. So many people wanted to do what he wanted. <laughs> wanted to show him their best efforts. Wanted to contribute. Wanted to be part. You know, it was again this wait for me. Let me let me come along with this wonderful game you're playing. Central to the game was Hubbard's e meter, a form of lie detector which he claimed could electrically detect emotional charge. Students spent hours, days, months, sometimes years, going over painful events, or engrams, in this or their past lives, trying to make the needle float. Proof that the engram was now cleared from their memories. Patrick, clear 386 Lee Eckert. 
It's like nothing else in the world. It's really, I feel quite free. <clears throat> Hubbard had designed an ingenious commercial product. The more past lives, the more memories, the more engrams to be cleared, all in a complex series of expensive courses. Making money, I think, to Hubbard was paramount. He wasn't that interested in it for himself. He did have perks. He did have his cars, his motorbikes, his books, his good food, his, and things like that. But, and eventually he had his, his villas and he had his estates and so on. But the money that he wanted predominantly was for power. Hubbard wanted to create a worldwide army of Scientologists. Going clear was only the first step. After that, further courses could improve your IQ, improve your work, turn you into a superman. The purpose of Scientology was to make the able more able. And he was always striving for that. And in everything he did, I think he was looking at that. Now, his idea was that if you could get every single person looking in the same direction, then you'd have a very powerful nation, you see. This photograph, composed by Ron Hubbard himself, betrays an extraordinary ambition he held for Scientology. The entire objective was to find a place that Hubbard could eventually turn into his own kingdom, with his own government, his own passports, his own monetary system. Uh, in other words, his own principality that he would be the benign dictator of. That was the objective. He had been having some auditing and, and doing some investigative auditing and looking at past lives and past experiences. And he ran into what he thought might be the past life of Cecil Rhodes. So he went to Rhodesia to check out what he had discovered in his auditing. He was there to attempt to uh, create a Scientology community in the country and eventually turn the country over into a Scientology country. He was looking for a home base for Scientology. Hubbard's vision of becoming a latter-day Rhodes failed. The Rhodesian government became suspicious of him and his visa was not renewed. Back in England, Hubbard was also under attack. Parents were worried by strange communications from children who had fallen under Scientology's thrall. There was a letter from her saying that she was disconnecting from me. Um, you probably are familiar with this, you've yes, seen it yes. in the paper, but that I was destroying her and that she didn't want to see me again. That's it, car, and it was signed. The newspapers were accusing him of being a fraud and lobbied the government to launch an inquiry. When the fire goes off, you know by the number that went off... Hubbard decided there was only one answer. He would take to the high seas. With his loyal band of disciples, he would move himself and his empire outside any government's jurisdiction. At one point, he turned around and said to us in a very sort of masterful um, way, in a very almost ambassadorial sort of way, he said, um, it's perfectly all right to step outside the law because the law itself is aberrated. So in order to achieve our ends, that gives us license to step outside the law. Hubbard's followers were about to see the consequences of life beyond the law as the Messiah became their dictator. In 1967, with his own navy of Scientologists, the Sea Organization, Ron Hubbard set sail. Hannah Eltrigan, then 24, went with him. She'd never crewed on a large ship before, but Hubbard detected that she was unusually well equipped for naval command. Hubbard called me into his cabin and stood right in the doorway of his cabin, fiddling with the e-meter, and I started asking me questions about when I had last been a captain. Well, this could only be past lives because I'd never been a captain in this life. So I started, you know, thinking back and came up with this past experience about being a space captain of a spaceship and being blown up in space and the planet was being invaded and all, these, this, all this fighting and blasting going on and, and so forth. And at the end of it, he peered over the e-meter at me and he said, were you one of the loyal officers? 
And at that point, I got this uprush, and I felt, good, I must have been one of those loyal officers. I must have been one of the elite. You know. The young Hannah was appointed captain of Hubbard's number two 